Oh yeah. Thor is directed by Kenneth Branagh, starring Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Natalie Portman, Anthony Hopkins, and Idris Elba, among many other people. It's the origin story of Thor, the god of thunder in Norse mythology, who was chosen to be on the throne of Asgard by his father, Odin. And due to the consequences of his arrogance and stupidity, Odin banishes him to Earth and strips him of all of his powers, uncovering along the way the mischievous plot of his brother, Loki, the god of mischief. Very recently, it was this movie's 10th anniversary, and I never had a chance to see it in theaters, unfortunately. And mostly that's because I wasn't aware that this was in the same continuity as Iron Man or Captain America. I just thought it was its own separate thing, like Spider-Man or X-Men. But it wasn't until the following year that I was able to catch on to what was really happening, that they were all in the same universe. I think I saw this when we got it at Blockbuster or Redbox at the time, and I didn't know anything about Thor or what his deal was in the comics. The only reference I had to Thor was the adventures of babysitting. Oh Thor, mighty god of thunder. Who is this kid? Thankfully, Thor has become a lot more relevant in pop culture due to Marvel Studios. I wouldn't call him one of my favorites, but watching this movie last night really reminded me of how just underrated the aspect of Thor is in the MCU. It's got a lot of out there elements to it. It takes place in this completely different realm of Asgard, among the nine realms as it's mentioned in the movie, and as it's, I'm sure, mentioned in Norse mythology. I'm not really familiar with all that stuff. But he's also a demigod, and something that on paper would not be really easy to do, like making him feel very human-like. To this movie's credit, which I don't really think it gets enough of, I think it really nails the human aspect of this character, whether it's the writing, Kenneth Branagh's directing, or the performance by Chris Hemsworth. And we'll get to it later, but on top of that, you got yourselves a really fantastic villain in Loki, played by Tom Hiddleston. And for a Marvel movie that's in the Phase 1 era of the MCU, I think it actually makes the movie very, very solid. Definitely not the first Iron Man, or the first Captain America. And I don't really think this movie gets enough credit for that. A lot of that, I think, is due to the arc that Thor experienced starting out as a pretty arrogant and stupid hothead to a more humble, caring, and selfless hero. So the movie starts with a cold opening where the characters of Selvig, Jane Foster, and Darcy are investigating this anomaly in the middle of the New Mexico desert, and they accidentally crash into Thor. And then we get an opening narration by Anthony Hopkins as Odin, where it chronicles the war between Asgard and Jotunheim the Asgardians and the Frost Giants, showcasing young Thor and Loki being pitted against each other as young boys by their father. Only one of you can ascend to the throne, but both of you were born to be kings. Not exactly fatherly material because he's basically causing a rivalry between the two. But before Thor can be appointed as the new king, a couple of frost giants break in to try to steal the Tesseract. Thor tries to get Odin to send his army to Jotunheim, and due to Thor's arrogance, Odin refuses to. So in an act of rebellion, Thor decides to go on his own to punish the frost giants. The design of Asgard is beautiful. The mixture of practical and CGI elements that were thrown in here, on my end at least, for the most part, it doesn't really look fake. Maybe a couple of shots where we first see Asgard from the mountain or whatever, or from the top of the city. It looks a little bit off in certain spots, but for the most part, I think it looks really well done. Especially during the fight between Thor and that big guardian. It doesn't look entirely fluid though sometimes, because it's a lot of flying and punching and kicking. But for the most part, like I said, I think the special effects do hold up. Not to mention the makeup on the Frost Giants. Like, they're actually actors in makeup. It's not motion capture effects, although there's nothing wrong with that at all. I like that Colm Fiore, who plays Laufey, the king of the Frost Giants, was actually willing to sit down for God knows how long to wear makeup. It adds to the creepiness of these creatures, too. If I saw Laufey sitting at the edge of my bed, I would probably more than likely wet myself. And the costume design is really weird and wacky, yet it all somehow feels legit. Even though there is like a self-awareness to it that, yeah, this is a little bit ridiculous, it almost seems to me like the movie's embracing it. Like with certain things that we see on Earth later on with the fish out of water stuff, we'll get to that later. Like with the helmet horns on Loki's helmet. On paper, that might be a little bit like out there for some people, and it might have been a little off-putting at the time in 2011, but somehow Marvel manages to make it relevant. So Thor and the gang arrive on Jotunheim to interrogate the Frost Giants. There's a bit of a verbal sparring match between the two. Run back home, little princess. Loki's reaction is more or less how I react to, and Odin as a result decides to banish Thor to Earth and strip him of all of his powers and his ability to wield the hammer Mjolnir. I was a fool to think you were ready. Father. Hey! Again, that's my reaction too. Anthony Hopkins is one of the greatest actors alive, and it is no different with him as Odin here. I mean, after all, he was Hannibal Lecter. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> 
So Thor arrives on Earth, no powers of any kind, running into Jane Foster and her colleagues, Darcy and Selvig. And the segment where Thor is on Earth has a lot of really funny moments, although sometimes it doesn't always work. But as far as the funny moments go is when he gets into a fight with the doctors and the security guards at the hospital. All it takes is one syringe of sedatives or whatever to knock him out. And of course, this scene. This drink, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! <laughs> Now, as far as Jane Foster goes, she doesn't annoy me as much as she might other people. I think in this movie, at least, she's probably the most interesting. Jane's very much driven by her desire to research astronomy, and her debates with Selvig, I think, are the most interesting because he's very skeptical and he's not really sure if any of this is true. One of my favorite lines from Jane in the movie is that magic is science that we don't entirely understand yet. And there's other moments like that throughout the movie, and I think it's very relevant to bring that up because we often see this in our culture nowadays, science versus religion, like they're at odds with each other. But I think like once you're able to break it down and see both sides, they're not all that incompatible with each other if you find a way to make them coexist at least. And science is really in a constant state of flux. So many hypotheses have changed throughout human history and once something new is established, science will just adapt and continue to move on. And once a bunch of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents led by Agent Coulson come in to steal her research material, Thor decides to go into the camp and steal them back while also getting his hands on Mjolnir. And the site where Thor's hammer is, is a bunch of people around trying to lift it to no avail. And we also get a cameo from the one and only. Did it work? I still remember the first time I watched this, when he turned his head and started talking, I squealed with joy because I instantly knew who that was. So Thor breaks into the site, takes on the shield guards, and tries to lift the hammer, but only to discover that his powers are gone completely and he can't lift it. And it's right here where he hits his lowest low, that he finally realizes that his arrogance and stupidity have led him to this point. And his conversation with Loki in the interrogation room, where Loki lies to him saying that your father's dead and your mother doesn't want you to return, and the only way that we could keep peace with Jotunheim is that if you stay banished on Earth completely. The lies that Loki tells him are what leads him to becoming a more better and caring person, and the Thor that we all know and love from the rest of the MCU. And we get a really beautiful, intimate moment with him and Jane when he's explaining the Nine Realms to her, drawing them on a piece of paper. Your ancestors called it magic, and you call it science. Well, I come from a place where they're one and the same thing. The images glimpsed through, uh, what did you call it, this, uh, this Hubble telescope. Hubble. <laughs> Hubble telescope. I gotta admit, because of this movie, sometimes I do say Hubble Telescope. I just realized that I forgot to say, Chris Hemsworth is perfect as Thor. I really cannot see anybody else playing him. He's charming, he's likable, he gets the arrogance down to a T, but he's also really good at showing his caring side as well. Someone that you can rely on and someone that you find really interesting. And despite the fact that he's got a muscular body, it's no wonder why Jane Foster was smitten with him. And I think the arc that he experiences is flawlessly executed. I read a quote somewhere that it's basically an Old Testament God becoming a New Testament God. Someone who wants to just pump his chest and wield his weapons towards any enemies that he crosses to becoming someone who doesn't want to necessarily fight anybody, but is always prepared to do so if needed. And as far as the rest of the cast, Jamie Alexander as Sif, Idris Elba as Heimdall, and Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Loki is probably the best Marvel villain that I think we've ever seen in the MCU. Besides maybe Thanos, I think he's tied as one of the best Marvel villains because this movie makes you completely understand his perspective. He wants his father's approval and that he will go to any length possible in order to get his father to love him. The thing that made Loki so close to our heart as a villain was that if you looked at the events of Thor from his perspective, he was the hero. He was the one who was saving the kingdom from his hothead brother who wasn't ready to his great credit that was that was something that uh, that Kenneth Branagh was was uh -huh. very much down with and Loki turns out to be a frost giant Laufey's son. During the war between Asgard and Jotunheim, Odin discovers baby Loki in the temple and feels compassion for him and decides to take him in as his own son, hoping to use him also to form some kind of peace between them and the rest of the Nine Realms. Because no matter how much you claim to love me, you can never have a frost giant sitting on the throne of Asgard father of the year. That's all I got to say. And therefore Loki is made the king of Asgard. And it turns out he was the one who allowed the frost giants to sneak into the Asgardian temple. So that way he can kill Laufey before he had the chance to kill Odin in order to see that Loki was able to stop the frost giants and that he could be viewed as a worthy king. God of mischief, God of deceit, God of lies. You got to admit. Spoken.
That movie was the first time I ever heard the name Loki. So Thor's friends arrive on Earth after Loki sends the big guardian to take on Thor, and Thor apologizes to Loki and offers to sacrifice himself in order to leave the people of the town alone. And Lord Zed from Power Rangers basically knocks him dead. And by the way, thanks a lot for that, screen junkies. Really, thanks. <laughs> but as a result of his self-sacrifice, he is deemed worthy and is able to wield the power of Thor by getting the hammer back. So is this how you normally look? More or less. It's a good look. And the final confrontation between Thor and Loki is very, very riveting. And I think it's very much in vain with what Kenneth Branagh has been used to doing it throughout his career. He's mostly known for doing Shakespearean projects. This is not something that he would usually do. And he was asked, why would you take on a comic book movie? And I don't remember the exact quote, but he basically said it's more or less the same thing about family and betrayal and trust and love and so on. And I think he's pretty much right about that. Thor and Loki both want their father's love and approval. The only difference is Loki has a pretty messed up way of doing it. And as many people say, that's what makes a great villain. Kenneth Branagh's style with the Dutch angles. Most of the time I'm able to let it go, but there's a couple of times where I go, okay, dude, you're really overdoing it here. Not terribly done, but sometimes it's just a little distracting. So inevitably, Thor has to destroy the Bifrost in order to keep Jotunheim from being destroyed, but as a result, he has to give up what he wants the most, being with Jane and returning to her. Because as we've seen their romance blossoming, I actually found myself kind of rooting for them. And it's really crushing to see him actually have to destroy the pathway. Only then for Odin to show up at the last minute and he has one last opportunity to show Loki some love and approval. I should have done it! For you! For all of us! No, Loki. Dads can be real sweethearts. So Thor has become very humble and has earned his father's approval, but yet he still mourns for the loss of his brother and longs to be with Jane. And I love the final scene where he talks with Heimdall, who's able to see Jane on Earth. And for me, there's a little underlying sense of hope that yeah, he's definitely gonna come back at some point. Also the music in that scene by Patrick Doyle, very, very underrated score, especially compared to the other MCU themes. And then we get a post credit scene where Selvig is talking with Nick Fury about the Tesseract. Well, I guess that's worth a look. Well, I guess that's worth a look. Also, uh, Kat Dennings as Darcy. Not a big fan. No, no. Except for this part. You dare threaten me? Thor was so puny. What? He was freaking me out! Of the three Thor movies that we've gotten so far, this one's my personal favorite because of the arc that he experiences and Loki as a villain and his motivations for doing what he does. There's a campiness to it that I think for the most part really works and it doesn't feel like a big adventures prequel. It feels more like its own movie with a couple of hints thrown into the mix with S.H.I.E.L.D. and the post credit scene. Doesn't really get a whole lot of credit as I think it should get. And I think more people should go back and give this another watch because a lot of people prefer Ragnarok, which I think is a fun movie, don't get me wrong. But for the reasons that I mentioned, I personally prefer this movie. So those are my thoughts on Thor. What's your guys' verdict? Comment below and tell me your thoughts, and I'll see you guys in the next video.